Hello there. Warm welcome to all of you. At the outset, I should uh, thank uh, my esteemed uh, colleague and professor, Professor H. S. Ray, who has delivered about 38 lectures on various aspects of non-ferrous metals. And it was at his request that I am able to join this program and share my knowledge, my experience and give an industry orientation to the non-ferrous metals industry in India, how it is poised for a quantum gem growth and where it is heading for in the coming years. Professor H. S. Ray has done numerous publications, authored numerous books on non-ferrous metals and this program is going to be unique for the country. It is going to be very useful, informative to the upcoming metallurgical engineers, material scientists and uh, in one shot, in one go, when they go through these 40 presentations, they will be updated on the extractive metallurgy part of non-ferrous metals their applications, the role of energy, environment and uh, the way the industry is likely to grow in the coming few years and uh, the conclusion would give you an overall view of where India stands at the current moment with respect to non-ferrous metals. To introduce myself, uh, my name very difficult name, Pugavendi, it is a Tamil name and uh, most of my colleagues call me as Mr. Pug. Uh, I was the immediate uh, past president of the Indians of Metals. Uh, I took over last year and handed over in July this year and uh, currently I am the Executive Director in of India Ledging Development Association based in Delhi. The Indians of Metals has given me so much exposure, so much contact with the Indian industry, both steel and non-ferrous industry as well as those involved in research, in teaching and thereby I could assimilate and gather so much knowledge data and information which I am going to share with you. Coming to my organization India Ledging Development Association, this organization is about 46 years old in this country, uh, set up as uh, an Indian office of a global group to disseminate information to the lead and zinc users how to use these two metals in a more efficient economic manner and this organization ILSDA as it is called currently is playing very critical role with the industry, with the policy planners and the government and also guiding the industry in market development, in standardization, in environmental uh, policies in recycling, etcetera. To give you a brief background about myself, I did metallurgical engineering from the good old REC Trichy, now called NIT Trichy, uh, followed by post graduation in business management and marketing management. I have a unique blend of about 35 years experience in non-ferrous metals industry particularly in the downstream applications of lead and zinc. In my initial years after my graduation, I also had a privilege of undergoing a special advanced uh, industrial training in UK under a program of the Confederation of British Industry. By virtue of my experience, my knowledge, I am a member of several committees in mines ministry which deals with all the non-ferrous metals, base metals. 
also Ministry of Environment for us, Central Pollution Control Board, etcetera. And currently, I am the chairman of the sectional committee in Bureau of Indian Standards dealing with lead, zinc, tin, antimony, and their alloys. Internationally, I am also very active in the various uh, committees, market development committee, R&D committee, etc. in the International Zinc Association, in the Lead Development Association UK, as well as the International Lead Zinc Research Organization based in North Carolina in US. Having done so much work, the industry, the global industry was kind enough to place on record whatever little work or good work I did and they honored me by presenting an international lead award uh, at Macau, China as late as in September 2009 is an international event and I consider that as a very positive motivating factor in my career. Coming to the lecture per se, as you saw in the title, Non-Ferrous Metals in India, Unleashing Its True Potential. The title is very deliberate and intentional. It is only now, nearly after about 60 years, that the full potential of non-ferrous metals is being exploited by India. For a long time, non-ferrous metals as well as the steel industry, they had a very stunted growth due to the restrictive government policies in licensing, in trade, in creating new capacities, in expanding the existing players. There were a lot of restrictions, but uh, the post India is a dark chapter in the case of metals, very limited growth, restrictive uh, outlook with the government. But after 1991, suddenly India has realized huge potential not only in production but also in domestic consumption as well as in exports and in international trade. And today, India apart from China is a major driving force in non-ferrous metals particularly in driving the dynamics of the non-ferrous metals market, their production, consumption, prices, stocks, etcetera. So, China and India are the major players in non-ferrous metals uh, in today's situation. Non-ferrous metals, everything other than steel that you see in the world, comprise of numerous non-ferrous uh, metals starting from aluminum, copper, lead, zinc, tin, gold, nickel, titanium, uranium, you can go on and on. In respect of size, this industry is becoming bigger and bigger in the country. The non-ferrous metals are relatively priced higher in few cases, much higher in many other cases and therefore, the value of non-ferrous metals produced and consumed in the country if one looks at, it will be a huge mind boggling figure with respect to steel for instance. And also this sector, non-ferrous metal sector being highly priced commodities, they also give plenty of revenue to the government through import duty, sales tax excise duty, etcetera. To the exchequer, it brings in plenty of money. Apart from the 
size in terms of revenue generation or the volumes, they play very critical roles in our daily lives. It so happens steel is highly visible, steel is seen everywhere, steel occupies the front page in newspapers, the banner headlines, but non-ferrous metals are somehow not given so much coverage or publicity or the common man does not notice the developments pertaining to non-ferrous metals. Many exciting things happen in this country during the last few years and if I am going to, I am going to be telling you very shortly and you will be surprised that so much has happened in this country in this sector which was not known to many across the country. Coming to non-ferrous metals I was mentioning, they play such vital roles in our economy, in our daily lives, in our society. In the kitchen you use aluminum in the form of pressure cookers, aluminum utensils, aluminum tiffin carriers, there are plenty of things that you use in the kitchen. You also have pipes steel pipes bringing drinking water to the kitchen or to the bathroom and they are all coated with zinc in the form of galvanized coating for corrosion prevention of the steel pipes which brings water to your house. But while you call it steel pipes, the zinc that is given there to coat the product pipe, nobody mentioned that or nobody recognizes that zinc is there. You drive your cars, you drive your scooters, there are plenty of aluminum components like carburetors, fuel pumps, door locks, variety of components which are all made of aluminum for instance. And very soon you will have aluminum, a lightweight metal material to be replaced by still lighter weight in nature, a non another non-ferrous metal, magnesium to bring down the weight of the cars to make uh, your uh, fuel consumption more economical when you use these vehicles. You also use for instance, the men folk they use a razor mash 3 in the morning they when they take it and they start shaving. The razor is made of zinc die cast body. We also use in our daily life zippers, metal zippers and sliders in our travel goods, purses, uh, ladies bags and jeans everywhere your metal zippers and slides, sliders made of zinc. A bathroom faucet, a bathroom fitting when you open the tap water, the body of the faucet, the bathroom fitting is made of a brass casting or a zinc die casting, then later on given chrome, chromium plating, chrome plating or you give variety of finishes like gold plating and silver plating, you give different types of finishes and textures. So, non-ferrous metals go for not only the body, even for plating them to give a good pleasing aesthetic appearance. Women use plenty of jewelry, gold, silver, now more and more young girls are going for platinum jewelry. To our houses, to the offices, to the industrial establishments, power is produced somewhere at a long distance, hydro electric source or thermal source, but the power is transmitted through aluminum conductors to long distances, because aluminum has got a very good electrical conductivity property. Many of the gadgets that we use, a laptop, the casing or your mobile casing, 
they are made of magnesium cast product there. So, what I am trying to tell you is that we use so many metals and materials in our daily life except steel, we do not notice all these non-ferrous metals. They play such a very critical strategic role in our daily lives. Non-ferrous metals play a very silent role, but very, very important roles in our daily life. Coming to the non-ferrous metals industry, if you go through the pages of history, India had a very rich heritage in non-ferrous metals. Some of the historic ages, eras were called after non-ferrous metals. Bronze age, somewhere around 3000 BC, lead metal used in plumbing for drinking water etcetera was used in the Indus valley somewhere around 2500 BC. Gold mines we did have in our country approximately 500 BC. Coming to zinc in a place like Zawa, Rajasthan as early as 1200 AD, India had zinc smelting. It is very difficult to appreciate today how our ancestors they would have melted a natural resource and recovered zinc out of it in a crude brick structure that what you see in the screen, a crude distillation column and that site is a, a historic site. Even today uh, in Rajasthan, one could see near Rajasthan and it is an international heritage site declared by the American Society of Metals. So, India had a primitive advantage, a very old uh, history I would say with respect to non-ferrous metals. Somewhere after industrial revolution, last century we lost our way, other countries took over, India, Egypt, China, these are the countries which had very primitive history in non-ferrous metals. But it so happens after going full circle, the ball has come back to our court once again as I told you earlier, it is India along with China which is now driving the non-ferrous metals industry, non-ferrous metals market. So, things have come full circle. If you see here in this picture beautiful creature creations, God alone knows how they would have made this kind of intricate castings, bronze casting, Lord Naraja there and also Rama statues beautiful ones in 13th century, the Hanuman statue there and even the bronze bell castings which you see on the screen again, how they would have melted, given shape to them, made intricate uh, designs, it is something that we cannot appreciate in today's uh, context. As I said, we have come full circle. If you look at uh, India, post independent India, we were largely uh, import dependent. India was depending more on import of non-ferrous metals from other countries and uh, we had very little domestic production. Uh, most of the non-ferrous metals were in the hands of the public sector under enterprises, public sector undertakings. And, uh, the public sector undertakings had very tight restrictive direction from the government and therefore, they were never allowed to expand, they were never allowed to go for exploration, for mining, for international trade. The slogan of those days was to create a self-sufficient India in non-ferrous metals. That is, whatever you produce, consume within 
the country and do very little of imports and if you can bring down the imports or if you can have import substituted items in the country that was all encouraged those days. So, domestic production was less import we were trying to discourage and as I said exploration mining and production they were all sort of restricted or curbed those days. And in the post independent India when India had become independent the priorities were also different agriculture, irrigation, education, health. So, so many other uh, criteria other uh, priorities were there therefore, the industry industry's role or non ferrous industries growth etcetera was very restricted as I mentioned very rigid industrial and trade policies. And it so happened uh, those days uh, post independent India again India did not have plenty of foreign exchange. Today we are sitting on a very comfortable foreign exchange reserve of around 275, 300 billion US dollars. Today that is our reserves, we are very comfortable foreign exchange reserves wise. But if you look at post independent India, we had very acute foreign exchange crisis in the country. Uh, we did not, we were wanting to use those foreign exchange more for import of essentials like oil or food etcetera and not for things like non-ferrous metals or capital goods etcetera. Therefore, foreign exchange reserve reserves limitation was another uh, negative factor and uh, fortunately in 1991 India made a major shift, a major turn around all the policies like trade policies, industrial policies they were all given up and India became a free trade, a free economy and there began the story of India. India becoming suddenly a big player in many sectors, service, manufacturing sector, automobiles etcetera. So, that is how the uh, story of uh, India. Uh, beginning from 1991 started and from that time onwards it is really an era of consolidation as I always call it. Suddenly you found Indian non-ferrous companies having global vision, a country where non-ferrous players were only looking inward they started looking all around the world post 1991. And after 1991 when the economic reforms, economic uh, liberalization was introduced suddenly you found uh, one after the other the non-ferrous companies which were with the government were privatized. Sterlite is one Vedanta as most of you would know uh, Mr. Anil Agarwal a global non-ferrous player uh, trying to become as big as uh, Ellen Mittal is there in the global steel uh, picture. So, Vedanta took over Hindustan zinc, they took over Bharat aluminum and today suddenly you find their capacities have been increased, the markets have expanded, they have gone for expansion in mining, they have gone for uh, their own power generation, they have gone for global acquisitions also. A company like Hindalco. Birlas, uh, Hindustan Aluminium Company, Indalco Industries, which was again a private sector company right from the beginning, but again due to the restrictive policy they were not allowed to expand or go in a big way. And they all started acquiring mines, Sterlite and Hindalco, they had taken over mines in Zambia in Australia, so that they can bring the natural resources copper concentrates from those countries, copper uh, concentrate rich countries like Australia and Zambia to India and do the smelting here because mining takes a long time and you may succeed or you may not succeed. Whereas, existing mines which are doing well and during the uh, depression days when things were bad globally, the overseas mines were looking for buyers 
international buyers and immediately Starlight and Hindalco started acquiring mine. That is a strategic acquisition uh, I would say and that is going to be a huge backup for any expansion of our production. Hindalco again took over one of the largest uh, global acquisitions as I would call it like Tata's taking over Chorus in the US, uh, Hindalco took over Novelis in the US that is a downstream company making uh, 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 aluminum beverage cans and flat products etcetera. So, Hindalco being a primary producer they could talk, take over a downstream company a big company in a 6 billion dollar acquisition and that was a ready market for them whatever they could produce they could send it to those countries that are in the US and uh, that is how they could build the synergy. Coming to a company like National Aluminum Company even today a public sector who were looking at domestic market only self sufficiency as I said earlier. Uh, now, they are trying to set up an aluminum smelter in Dubai. India has got huge wonderful bauxite reserves and therefore, Nalco wants to have a smelter an aluminum smelter in a country like Dubai where power is cheaper as you all know aluminum or even non-ferrous metals extraction most of them are power intensive operations. Therefore, taking the bauxite from here to a country where power is cheaper, so you will have a tremendous advantage in value addition. Nalco is also planning to take over and manage an Ind Indonesian aluminum company. Similarly, globalized is two, two way affair, Dubai aluminum company Dubal is trying to set up a smelter aluminum smelter in Orissa with a huge investment of about 1.1 billion US dollars. Nalco is also currently going through expansions aluminum and alumina for a value of about US 1 dollar billion. Suddenly, PSU uh, in al aluminum Nalco is trying to expand in a big way. Can you believe a company in steel Jindal Southwest they are also now getting into non ferrous metals they are now setting up a big aluminum activity in Vizag where bauxites are uh, bauxite resources are available there and at a huge investment of 9000 crore rupees again a big investment there. So, that is the way things are happening now Birla copper or even uh, sterlite copper in Tuticorin, uh, Birla copper in Dahej in Gujarat a country where we used to talk of capacities like 50,000 tons per year or 1 lakh tons per year. Today, these companies are talking of global scales of production, global economic scales of production, 1 million ton smelters for copper in Dahej and in Tuticorin. That is going to be huge affair and India will be one of the big uh, uh, copper producers. Hindalco as I said earlier they are also going for big expansion in aluminum and alumina. Vedanta alumina refinery again that is coming up in Varissa and uh, they are also um, in the process of coming up with a green field aluminum smelter at Korba. Hindustan zinc in Udaipur Rajasthan which used to be a small player in the pre liberalization regime with about 1 lakh 50,000 tons or 2 lakh tons capacity. Today, they are gradually expanding their capacities to 1 million tons like zinc copper they are doing sterling tuticorin in the standing they are also expanding the capacity to 1 million ton per annum again ag another global level uh, uh, scale and that way in the standing will become one of the world's top ranking zinc producers. Hindustan zinc is also expanding the primary lead capacity to 85,000 tons. While talking about all this I should tell you it is only now India is doing plenty of expansions, expansion in their mining, acquiring mines in other countries, expanding their production, expanding the domestic market. This is the way industry has been growing in the last few years 
and that is where there is going to be huge amount of opportunities for everyone, for the entrepreneur, for those who are employed, for those who are coming up with ancillary industry etcetera. The story does not end with only Indian players, all the global mining companies well known big names, they are all very active in India, they see the way India has been growing suddenly, fastest growing economy in the world uh, after China and they are all now very active having their own activities, their offices, project activities, BHP Billiton for instance in aluminum, copper, lead, zinc etcetera, Rio Tinto, D Beers, Phelps Dodge in copper, lead, zinc etcetera, Geo Mysore, gold for instance, Anglo American in many non ferrous metals and even a company like Hitachi Metals wanting to go for a downstream product like aluminum components, wheels for our cars etcetera. So, the global companies are very, very active, one Australian company is already active in Rajasthan, another one in Karnataka in gold etcetera. So, we are now trying to exploit our natural resources which we were not doing so far in the past. Coming to the non-ferrous metals global production, if you have um, uh, you can have a look at uh, this slide aluminum, copper, zinc, lead, nickel etcetera, 2009 production they are all given there, 2010 there is a growth in all the sectors in all the metals, 38 to 40 in aluminum million tons 18.1 to 18.2, 11.14 to 12.26 million tons in zinc, lead 8.99 million tons to 9.65 million tons nickel 1.28 million tons to 1.44 million tons. That is the growth story in produ production and consumption. Let us go to the consumption now, this is the picture here. Again growth in consumption in aluminum, copper, zinc, lead, nickel, estimated production is there and also 2010 all in million tons. Now, let us have a look at the picture in India, 2004 to 2005 we have the capacities in Alco, Hindalco, Vedanta and uh, thereafter additions were made in their capacities, the expanded capacities are shown there 4 lakh 50,000 tons in Nalco, Hindalco 514,000 tons, Vedanta 381,000 tons. Yeah, an addition of about uh, 0.445 million tons uh, and that takes India to 1.3 million tons and the production in 2006-2007 uh, was somewhere around 1.15 million tons in India, 2007-8 1.25, 2008-2009 1.25, 2009, 1.32. So, that is how it goes. Now, you see in this picture beautiful uh, illustration here, aluminum end uses about 31 percent goes in the electrical sector, consumer durable about 23, transport 18, building and construction 8 percent, packaging 6 percent, industry and machinery 10 percent, others 4 percent, aluminum alloy wheels extruded section of aluminum in the picture you see in the slide. So, the important point to be noted here is plenty goes in the electrical sector and in the consumer durable sector. What I want to mention to you here is India is now on a big uh, boom in building and construction infrastructural activity so that 8 percent you have huge market potential. So, in the case in transport 18 sec percent again uh, a huge opportunity lies and packaging aluminum foils, aluminum cans, aluminum collapsible tubes. So, so many things that we use in our daily life and that is only 6 percent again there is a huge market uh, or business uh, potential there. Coming to copper, Birla copper 500,000 tons, sterlite copper 300,000 tons, Hindustan copper 
see the typical scale of uh, economy those days 47,500 uh, tons is the capacity of Hindustan copper and Birla copper and starlight copper are now talking of taking their capacities to 1 million tons in the next few years. Swill or Jagadia copper as we call it now and that is about 50,000 ton that is the capacity of copper in the country 8,97,500 ton. Production you see here refined copper production 657,000 tons to 651 there is a slight uh, uh, um, increase and then again decrease that is something to do with uh, the way prices moved in the last few years. When prices go up suddenly copper prices went very high last year and uh, uh, that was a great disincentive. Many were trying to curtail or bring down their usage pattern and therefore, it had a setback in demand and production etcetera. Again you are seeing a beautiful illustration the end uses of copper again 54 percent in electrical sector, transport 11, industrial machinery 12 percent, consumer durables 10 percent, building and 13 percent you see beautiful uh, sheets there copper sheets and copper tubes, copper tubes mainly go for uh, your air conditioners and uh, refrigerators. Um, copper plays such an important role you are uh, mixy for instance electrical gadget whatever you use copper is used in transformers and uh, as winding wires in electrical sector copper plays a very quiet role again. Coming to zinc and lead production capacities you are seeing here Hindustan zinc, Chanderia, Debari in Rajasthan and Vizag the capacity is around 5,89,000 tons and Benani zinc in Kochi based on imported zinc concentrates a capacity of 38,000 tons, a total capacity of 6,27,000 tons as far as zinc is concerned and uh, Hindustan Zinc Limited has a primary lead production capacity of 85,000 tons. Coming to the production you saw the uh, capacities in the earlier one you see the way zinc production has increased from 3,80,000 to about 5,82,000 tons from 2006 to 2009 and primary lead again is increasing 44,000, 58,000 and 60,000 etcetera. But uh, the important point there you see a star there significant lead recycling in India this is only primary lead what you are seeing here as production from the native ores in Rajasthan and plenty of lead is going in lead acid batteries, car batteries, scooter batteries, batteries used in your houses for inverters, in hospitals, in offices, many other areas and all the batteries are when they are scrapped, when they are disposed of then you can have them for recovery of. Uh, lead metal that is sizable in India we should be one of the largest uh, lead recycling nations in the world maybe about 3, 3.5 lakh tons of lead being recycled in the country it is recycled, reuse, recycle, reuse and there that is the way it goes and there is no loss in property or in the functional performance of the metal when you recycle them. You can see the growth rate zinc and lead about 15 percent something remarkable lead 10 percent while most of the developed countries in the world they are all having very low growth rates uh, European Union or the North American continent or the other countries uh, in Australia etcetera they are all witnessing marginal growth 2 percent 3 percent 1.5 percent growth etcetera whereas India is seeing 15, 10 percent growth levels and that is the way the country is going. Now mineable reserves at Hindustan Zinc Limited you can see do we have enough sources that is a very key question. The country may be requiring more metals but do we have the resources. Rampura Agucha is one of the best um, zinc lead uh, resources in the world and uh, like bauxite in the east coast of India which is very good uh, compared to many other uh, locations 
Rampura, which has got one of the best uh, natural resources containing very high amount of lead and zinc and their production mining production 3.75 million tons yearly. In 2008, they had increased expanded the capacity to 5 million tons. Rajpura Dariba again another mine 0.75 million tons became 1.25 million tons in 2008. Zawar mines 1.02 million tons becoming 1.35 million tons by 2010. All of them are in Rajasthan as you see here and there are other parts of the country where you have plenty of resources like uranium in Meghalaya, uh, so gold in Rajasthan, Karnataka etcetera. There are many other areas, Orissa, um, Sikkim where we have plenty of mineable resources. We have to exploit them fully. Coming to the zinc end use applications, uh, whatever zinc that we produce or recycled or imported, about 75 percent of them goes for galvanizing, coating of iron and steel in different forms, sheets, pipes, wires, buckets, uh, crash barriers, guard rails in the highways, use zinc in all these uh, uh, products. 75 percent go, the 10 percent in dry cells. All of us use dry cell, it contains the zinc sheet on the outer can, what is called callet, and uh, we are using it, but without knowing there is zinc in it, and that is a very important portable power source for your uh, razors, walkman, your uh, torch lights, your uh, wall clock, everywhere use a dry cell battery, zinc is there. Die casting again, as you see here, 10 percent zinc goes there, and chemicals and alloys chemicals of zinc and the chemi uh, alloys of zinc, brass etcetera about 5 percent there. Coming to lead uses, where does India um, put all the lead? About 80 percent of the lead goes in the battery sector, lead batteries, chemicals about 9 percent, alloys 6 percent and cables 5 percent. 80 percent lead going in this country speaks volumes the way the industry, uh, battery industry has been growing. Battery has become a household product, which used to be an industrial product long time ago. Every house has a computer, your children, the ladies, everyone operates computers in the house and there is an UPS below and that contains lead acid battery for backup, energy backup for the computer UPS and computer industry is a growing industry in the country, IT sector. Similarly, the inverter market, many parts of India are short of power, there is power cuts round the year or peak months, peak summer months and inverter is become such an essential uh, ingredient of every house like you have a washing machine, like you have a micro oven or a, like you have a, a mixi, uh, inverter has become an essential tool. Therefore, the automotive population the inverters, inverter market, the UPS market is driving the lead demand in the country. Nickel again very important non-ferrous metal, India does not produce even 1 gram of nickel, but there are resources there. Companies like Jindal Stainless Steel, they are trying to explore this resource and produce nickel and we consume about 30, 35,000 tons totally imported and 65 percent goes in stainless steel uh, manufacture, other steel again nickel is put there as an ingredient in about 10 percent, non-ferrous alloys 12 percent, plating nickel plating 8 percent others are there. So, largely it is stainless steel uh, is the major outlet. Nickel again shot up uh, price wise last year and that was uh, uh, one year where people are trying to produce low nickel, zero nickel, uh, stainless steel etcetera. Now, coming to the non-ferrous metals per capita consumption wise, is there a potential for India or where does India stand? In this picture you are seeing India blue there, China um, um, dark blue there and UK there as a greenish shade. Now, in this if you see India is using about 0.8 kg per head, whereas China about 4.6, 
both are billion population countries. China is 1.3 billion, India is 1.1, but see the market potential opportunity 0.8 in India and 4.6 aluminum per head. And look at copper again similarly 0.8 in India, 2.7 in China and 4.1 in a developed country like UK. See the gap between India and China 0.8 to 2 points almost 3 times. Zinc again similar story 0.4 kg per head per capita consumption and 1.8 in China and 3.1. So, that clearly is a message how India has to gear up more exploration, more mining, more recycling to, to see that plenty of metal is available. And what is important is the industry, the producers have to look for expanding the domestic market. The plenty of applications, the plenty of steel which is not galvanized, the plenty of places where aluminum is not being used like in packaging for instance. So, we have to exploit this potential. The consumer wants durable products, new products, new materials. That is the opportunity is there. The industry has to go for creativity in market development. Now, coming to the non-ferrous metals resource base, you see in this sli slide, is India again a question I asked you earlier, do we have enough resources? If you see here in this slide, bauxite about uh, see 8.8 percent of the world bauxite resources are with India out of the total. Lead zinc ores about 15 percent, good ores, lead zinc ores we have in the country. Copper was not plenty, maybe about 1.1 1 percent or 1.2 percent. That is where India is going for more and more of acquisitions of copper concentrate producing countries. Mines are being acquired in those countries. Therefore, somewhere we have resources we have to exploit fully and use it for our manufacture, create value addition, create new markets, outlets, etcetera. And in some places where we do not have our own resources, we have to go for taking over those resources. Now, coming to the story, India's economic growth story, you can see uh, uh, the whole world looks at India now. Copenhagen was a recent example. Everyone wanted to have India being taken on the bandwagon, so that there is an agreement there. Whether it is G 7 or G 22, India is a key player now. In UN Security Council, India is going to have a role, India is going to be a permanent member very soon. Therefore, the country is in a different uh, frame of mind, frame of growth. While other countries in 2008, the global economic growth was only 3.8 percent, India's growth was 8 percent, something phenomenal. And 2009, Again, global average would be around 2 percent or so global economic growth, while India's growth is already around 6.5, 7 percent. Next year, the government wants to go for 8, 8.5 percent and 10 percent later. Therefore, India is now in a different growth story, growth momentum. While many are zero or negative growth, US witnessed a marginal growth in the third quarter recently after several years of the depression, the great depression as they call it. So, India's growth is very good and here whatever I have shown you as uh, the growth uh, figures, it is all based on the IM figures. So, that is the way India has been growing. Again you are seeing here China become the third largest economy replacing Germany. So, China has become a key a player in the world and India again another major force, a trillion dollar economy. We are now in the process of accelerating our growth momentum. India is putting lots and lots of money in many key infrastructural areas and our billion population in both these countries are looking for improved living standards, new lifestyles, new products and therefore, in the people also want uh, improved services, goods, etcetera. And uh, these two countries, India particularly, is now seeing many things in the country, new things which we did not have earlier. Cell phone, for instance, 
everybody in the rural areas you can see having the connectivity, instant connectivity, which is not something that they were used to earlier. And now, computers are becoming even more easily available in the rural markets, two wheelers, three wheelers and nano very soon will be a car very commonly seen in our tier 2, tier 3 cities and rural markets. So, the people are looking for newer and newer things and that is the way the story is changing. Now, coming to the growth, uh, the world economic growth from 1984 to 2009, you are seeing in this graph. Again, this is a picture from the IMF, International Monetary Fund and you can see from 1984 onwards, the GDP growth of the developed economies as a percentage of the share of the world has gone down continuously and 2009 it's somewhere around 20 percent, the blue curve there and the emerging economies, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Russia, all these countries have increased their growth uh, momentum, have accelerated their growth momentum and about 80 percent of the world GDP comes from these emerging economies. The pattern, the growth pattern, the economic growth pattern is completely changed now. So, what do we do now? What do we do now in this country for non-ferrous metals? It might apply to even non-ferrous uh, metals, it would apply to even steel industry also. We need conducive policies for mining and exploration. Our policy should be very investor friendly, encouraging to the users, encouraging to the entrepreneurs. We, uh, there should be a proper land uh, um, rehabilitation policy uh, by which you are able to give employment, um, uh, some kind of a livelihood to those who are being displaced. At the same time, we should go for exploring our mines in, um, in Orissa, in Rajasthan, in many other states and more importantly, we have to invest more and more in our R and D not only in manufacture, but also in market development, in product development, in new materials. So, that is where we will be having a tremendous advantage, innovation led growth has to come in this sector also. And more importantly, the companies who are producing these vital non-ferrous metals, various uh, um, products they all have to join together, they all have to join together rather than competing and fighting for share, their share in the cake, they can go for expanding the cake. The country wants many, many new products, the markets are unlimited. So, we have to exploit this market potential, the hidden market potential and go for expanding the cake, so that everyone pro prospers in the game. And more importantly, as I said, most of the products, whatever we are using in our daily life, industrial life, after some time they are all scrapped, whether it is electronic waste, your uh, mobiles or your uh, keyboard, computers, your remote con uh, remotes that you are using or the pressure cooker, or the dry cell battery lead acid battery, the electrical uh, goods that you are scrapping and throwing to your cupboard or wherever, all of them contain plenty of non-ferrous metals, plenty of precious metals also, silver, lead, gold, um, platinum, titanium, all kinds of things are there in these um, gadgets, these products. So, we have to go for recycling. Unfortunately, recycling in our country, we have not been having very environment friendly, eco friendly recycling so far. We have had crude practices, but the country is gradually shifting from crude primitive recycling practices to more energy, energy efficient and environment friendly recycling, so that you have recycled metal and you are able to also put them to 
the same use or new uses and this way the country will be saving perhaps plenty of investment which will be otherwise putting in mining and exploration. In the case of zinc and lead we are already doing and the recycling is becoming more environment friendly and the government wants more and more environment friendly recyclers in steel, non ferrous e-waste etcetera and that is the way sustainable development has to be carried forward and that is going to be good for the country forever. Thank you very much.